Hello. Hello. So, How are you doing? Uh, I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. I'm pretty excited. I like your yeah. setup. Yeah, it's been uh, since the pandemic. Kind of invested a little bit, uh, you know, when things went online. So, Luis, yeah. this is uh, uh, this is for my uh, new podcast, uh, which I have thought uh, the name of it would be uh, Beyond Phrenology. And as okay. you can imagine, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah. I think the viewers would get to know why Beyond Phrenology as we, you know, start speaking. And mm -hmm. and and welcome, uh, you know, uh, and thanks for agreeing to be my first guest on this podcast. Uh, and for others to, for me to introduce, uh, Louis, Louis is a, a assistant professor of philosophy and cognitive science at University of Central Florida. And I've got to know from some sources that he's very popular among undergrads, uh, you know, for his uh, teaching and motivation. And, you know, feels like he's bringing a lot of change in how newcomers think about neuroscience uh, and the whole enterprise and we'll we'll go deep dive into that uh, but before uh, we actually start discussing the subject uh, Anuri, would you uh, tell a little bit about yourself uh, in your own words yeah happy to um so first uh, thanks madur for inviting me um this should be should be fun exciting first time i'm glad to be a trendsetter in this you'll see what not to do in the future after uh, interviewing me. Um, just kidding. Hopefully it'll be all positive. Yeah. Um, so who am I? Um, yeah, so as, as, as you said, I'm um, Associate Professor of Philosophy and Cognitive Sciences at the University of Central Florida. Um, I am originally from Southern California. I went to um, the University of San Diego and studied English and philosophy. And at the time I studied philosophy just for fun. Um, and I thought I was going to be an English teacher. Uh, so when I graduated, I was an English teacher for a few years, but I couldn't stop thinking about philosophy. So I went back to grad school and did a master's at San Diego State. And what I found was I still liked philosophy, uh, especially philosophy of mind. But I, I just, I was frustrated with what I perceived as the lack of progress in, in understanding mind and its relation to brain and bodies and, and things like that. So I started uh, doing more interdisciplinary work and looking at biological theories of consciousness and things like that. And so I ended up uh, going to graduate school at the University of Cincinnati. Um, they do an interdisciplinary philosophy and the life sciences PhD program. Uh, but I also did a graduate degree in experimental psychology at the same time. Uh, so during that time, um, I worked with Tony Chimero um, and some other uh, Gibsonian ecological psychologists. And so that's where the corruption began. So I first went into grad school thinking that I was a reductionist and that everything interesting about cognition and being in the world was all between our ears and in the brain. And after being exposed to ecological psychology, which you know we can talk about in more detail later, I started questioning um, both the sufficiency of the brain, but even the necessity of the brain in some cases um, to explain or account for various kinds of intelligent behavior. And so I learned about embodied cognition, I learned about extended mind, things like that. But I also uh, was exposed to dynamical systems theory and complexity science as well during that time. And so taken together, um, that was the launching pad, this ecological, embodied, dynamic, complex systems approach. Uh, that's kind of informed all the work I've done since then. So since I've been uh, at the University of Central Florida, I've continued working on issues of embodiment, um, dynamics, and, and things like that. So this, you you mentioned a couple of things, I think, which is a, are a good segue into what we are planning to discuss. One is the relationship between brain, mind, and body, you said. Uh, are brain and mind two different things? Uh, right? Uh, am I picking on the right words here? Yeah, so you're asking the easy questions right off the bat. Are the brain and the mind two different things? Well, I think it helps um, when we're generally speaking um, across disciplines and maybe even when we're teaching classes 
to refer to them as different things in the sense that the brain is this specific organ that's located in your head. Uh, and the mind refers to a various sorts of capacities. So things like cognition or consciousness or the control of behavior. And so <clears throat> when we're loosely talking, I don't see any problem uh, with referring to them differently because they refer to different things uh, in the sense that um, when I want to understand why did Madur reach for his coffee cup, right? I can explain this in a folk psychological kind of way. He desired, he was thirsty, he wanted you know, a cool glass of iced coffee, which is what I think you're drinking. It looks delicious, by the way. Uh, he reaches for this cool glass, right? And that's all explained at a folk psychological level. And for a lot of things, when we're just interacting, that's all we need. Yeah. We could also give it a more detailed account. You know, um, there are, there's activity in his amygdala. You know, he has sorts of stimulation there. His sensory motor cortex is activating in a certain way as he's reaching. Right. There's activity in his, in his nerves. And that's another description that I think would mirror the folk psychological description, but it's for different purposes. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of the epistemic sense. Now, if you want to get deeper philosophy, right, if you want to get the metaphysics of it, that's where, you know, uh, we can say, um, not we, but at least me, I would say they are they are just one thing ontologically. Um, when we refer to folk psychological descriptions, we're just referring to the physical uh, instantiations of those things. Right. What's hard, what's hard though, is, um, is it just the brain? I'm putting scare quotes with my fingers just in case this is just audio. Uh, you know, is it just the brain or is it also the body? Is it also the world? Those things might have to be taken into account when we give a physical, a full physical description. Right. So how, how do things differ? So you said brain as an organ, as a, as a physical substrate inside the body. So what's special about the brain as an organ? Uh, I mean, we have kidneys, right? And kidneys, uh, in, a, in a very late terms, they, they filter, let's say, uh, uh, the water out of the body, uh, along with uh, some uh, you know, excretionary compounds. Uh, why do we have to think about brain as something different? Uh, like we don't have a whole sciences. Yeah, we have nephrology, but we don't ha have whole sciences of kidney. So for example, when, I, when you said that Madhur is reaching for a cup of coffee, would it be correct to say that uh, it's Madhur's brain which is reaching the cup of coffee? Because we attribute a lot of things to the brain, whether we are talking about scientists writing papers or whether we are talking about lay people talking. It's like my brain has been thinking about this thing. So what's the distinction between like me, Madhur, and my brain, um, you know, as doing things? Yeah, no, those are great, great questions. Um, so I think um, uh, just straightforward answer is, you know, Madhur or Louis does not equal brain, right? I think this is, this is a, a fallacy. Um, uh, there's a philosopher, uh, Peter uh, Hacker and um, one of his, and he wrote a book with one of his colleagues, uh, and they refer to this as the Mariological fallacy. Now, you might think whatever you want about Hacker, you might think whatever you want about their full philosophy and their their Wittgensteinian stuff, whatever. I think that they are right about pointing out this fallacy. Right? We the fallacy is basically we are referring to one part uh, as defining the whole in this yes. case, and this part is defining a person. Yes. Um, by just their brain, when actually the person is their brain, the skull, the body, the nervous system, right? The movement in the body, the interactions with the environment, all of these things are really what the person is. Yes. So that's, you know, in reference to the first kind of part of your, your inquiry, right? So are you just your brain? I would say no. And this is contrary to, um, you know, a lot of the philosophy of neuroscience and a lot of popular neuroscience that came up in the late 80s and during the 90s. So Nobel Prize winner, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Francis Crick, right? He had this yes. book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, you know, and it starts with this, you know, infamous set of lines where he says, you are just your neurons. You are just the activity of, of that, you know, in your brain. And it's astonishing because it's amazing and this yeah. and that. And, and, and I think, you know, other scientists like Christoph Koch 
Yes. Um, a lot of neurophilosophers like Pat and Paul Churchland, um, you know, they were really pushing this line of thought that you are your brain. Yeah. But this was fallacious, right? This was this was a problem, and this is what um, some neuropragmatists. So there is a, a movement, neuropragmatism. They referred to um, this stage in the development of our understanding of mind yeah. and body as another stage in Cartesian thinking. Right. So Descartes argued there was a mind-body dualism, right? That your mind is this different kind of substance, interacts yeah. with the body in some way, right? That was like first level dualism. Yeah. The next level dualism is this more scientifically respectable kind of dualism where now it's not a substance in your body, it's your brain in your body, right? right? Where the brain is some magical kind of organism yeah. Right. And, you know, in which it defines who Madur is, who yeah. Louis is like, I am just that brain. If I were to take that brain out, yeah. and if we, if you and I were to switch bodies, right, let's do a thought experiment, right? Yeah. Let's, you know, carve into our skulls. Uh, it'll be pretty easy because you and I have very short hair. So yeah. they'll carve into our and, skulls, right? And, and very similar skull shape. It is. Yeah. A beautiful skull yeah. shape. So smooth. I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm actually very proud of my, uh, Kind of very close to spherical, yeah, symmetric skull. Me too. It might yeah. not too pointy, you know. So, but we could have a whole podcast yeah, about our skull, of course. Um, <laughs> but if you and I were to just switch our brains, right? Following from this astonishing hypothesis, yeah, my friends, Crick, then that would mean that I was in your body, and now you are in my body. Yeah. But as people in, uh, you know, neuropragmatism. That's just one very small field, but more largely, the people in embodiment, right. ecological, those kinds of approaches, they would say, no, that's not quite right, okay? Something really interesting is happening when you switch a brain, right? But that's not going to be it, because it's not just your brain. It's yes. your brain in that particular body, in that particular world, right, that's going to define who you are. So, so, Liz, in, so let's say that we have everything same. Uh, we have the same dimensions. We have the same weight, like almost, you know, completely same anatomical uh, measurements for the most part. Do you think even then uh, we cannot imagine the brain being switched and we switching our personalities? Or so, what is it about the brain-body interaction which makes uh, the role of the body so important in defining us? Yeah, so are, are you asking if if we had the same body, basically, and we just switched brains? Yeah. Like exactly. the same dimensions? Yeah. Yes. I think that would be more, it would be more like us. Yeah. Right? So, um, you know, if you and I were the same height, same weight, our arms were the right. same length, all that kinds of stuff, and then yes. we switch our brains, I think that would be more of a uh, preservation of who we are right so but see, then there's where, also things like yeah i'm sorry go ahead yeah so where i'm trying to go towards this see we both have frontal cortex cortices right we both have different regions of the brain which neuroscientists describe different roles we both have those and when we talk about circuits right for example a reach to grasp circuit we both have a reach to grasp circuit in our brain right the so-called reach to grasp circuit we can go into whether it exists or not that's a different issue uh, then within those circuits, we have ideas like neural manifolds. So we both have those manifolds. Uh, that's why we are able to do these tasks. So what exactly is defined uh, is defining you as Louis and me as mother? Like, is it the number of neurons? Is it the connections? Is it is it how my reach to grasp interacts with my postural circuit? Or where does this distinction between us as individuals come? Uh, you know. Uh, at the level of uh, brain or neurons or circuits or at what scale the distinction comes. comes yeah, so I have yeah. to I have to thank you for these questions because yeah. there's a part there's a part of my mind uh, yeah. that um, have dust on it, and now we're having this conversation. It's like it's like you're blowing the dust off of it because <laughs> I haven't thought about these are actually um, yeah. metaphysical issues. I think there's some deep metaphysical questions yeah. and. Um, the type of metaphysics that this is making me think of, and when I say blow the dust off, because I haven't been using my philosophy of mind stuff, mm. uh, you know, in a while, so this is great. Um, but the particular aspect um, of philosophy of mind that this ties to is personal identity. Yeah. Right. So who are you? What makes you you? And 
for some people, you know, going back to Descartes, right, or even contemporarily, maybe some people who have more kind of religious or spiritual leanings, they might say they're the soul, right, some sort of substance that's different from your body. Okay, that's a whole other set of issues, right? Yeah. Then fast forward and let's go, well, then it's just the brain. The brain is who you are, right? Yeah. That's not going to be satisfactory to me uh, for various reasons that we've talked about. So what is it then? How are we going to define, you know, who we are? And oh, that's just that's just a really tough question because I kind of showed my cards already. I'm not going to go with uh, the Cartesian dualist. Yeah. Be, you know, again, let's just bracket that because we, you know, I want to be a naturalist. I want to be a physicalist. I want to be a, you know, scientific about these questions. So, so the dualism's not going to work. So why not the brain? That seems to be physical enough. And like you said, we have the same um, neural circuits, you know, for reach to grasp, where we have the same kind of manifolds um, that are guiding these kinds of behaviors. So again, as you said, you're just pushing me on it. So then what are you, right? There's a lot of different ways I can respond to this. Yeah. One is the circuits work. The circuits don't do anything unless they're part of a network that's part of a body, right? There is no yeah. arm movement unless there's a connection to an arm or a connection to other you right. know, parts of the nervous system, right? Right. So there's already going to be a lot of variation between these. Right. Manifolds vary actually quite, quite widely across people. Yeah. Right. Whenever we look at manifolds, we're looking at the dimensionally reduced data, right? And yes. so there's a lot of abstraction in that data. And so we find abstractly similarities between us, but it's that variation that's going to define who we are. It's the science of reach to grasp that needs that dimension reduction yes. right? in order to do things like prediction or manipulation yeah. or modeling. But in terms of the metaphysics of who we are, that's not going to cut it. So that leaves me with two potential paths. Yeah. One is um, what philosophers of mind call uh, animalism. And animalism is the idea that we are defined by being the kind of biological organism that we are. So my genetics play a strong role, right? My, my cells, the particular kinds of cells and their composition are going to define who we are. And we have a history, right? right? There's the history of my body now that goes all the way back to when I was a teenager and then it goes to childhood, you know, and eventually yeah. down, you know, to a fetus and things like that. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is psycho to look at it psychologically. And this is a uh, tradition that is usually ascribed to John Locke. So John Locke said, and this is a philosopher, um, he said, what defines you is the connection between your memories, right? It's this continuous flow. Yeah. So why am I the same person that I was yesterday? Not because there's a soul that connects me, not because it's the same biological brain, but because it's my memories that connect me. Yeah. And because I want my cake and eat it too, I want to do a little combination of both the biological and the psychological. Yeah. So I'd like to say that it's the memories, but it's the memories instantiated in particular selves. Right. And so why are you Madur? Well, because you are the same guy who has a continuity of cell division yes. across time, which also connects to a continuity of memories across time. And so that's going to be a big difference between you and me, even if we right. switch brains and even if we have similar reach to grass circuits, even if we have similar manifolds. Right. So that was a big question. And I hope I, I addressed. No, uh, I think, I think that's the most convincing uh, answer uh, somebody has given to me, you know, for this question. And not that I've asked this question to a lot of, uh, uh, you know, folks, but, uh, but still the most convincing answer, uh, you know, I can think of and I've ever received. Uh, you know, from the same uh, uh, set of answers you gave, uh, coming going back to uh, Peter Hacker, uh, what a coincidence, last night actually I was watching, I didn't know about Peter Hacker. Uh, and uh, as you know, I'm not that deep into philosophy as you are. Uh, I discovered him last night. I was a little bored uh, and wanted to search something on YouTube and I encountered him and one of his lectures in fact, where he talked about Francis Craig, uh, Edelman, Coach, and Churchland. 
uh, and a lot of well-known uh, neuroscientists who actually uh, have shown this kind of policy in what they have written and how they think about the brain. Uh, so that's a nice coincidence. And I would like to you know, put the link and uh, suggest viewers to, to look for that lecture. It's, it's pretty revealing. Uh, I wish I had uh, watched it you know, years before. Yeah, no, thanks for, yeah, I'd like to see that link. Um, and his his colleague that he writes some of these books with is um, uh, Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, that's the last name. So Bennett and Hacker. Awesome. That goes in my notes. So really coming back to the second thing, you said that you started questioning about the sufficiency and necessity of the brain. So could you like to, would you like to elaborate a little bit on uh, both these aspects and what exactly were you question about the brain in terms of its efficiency and necessity? Yeah, good. So, uh, you know, when I talk about necessity and sufficiency, I'm using, again, more kind of philosophical, argumentative kind of style. And so um, necessity are things that have to be there for a situation to occur. Um, Sufficiency is when you have all that is needed for the thing to occur. So um, oxygen is necessary for human life, yes. but it's not sufficient, right? Because if I have oxygen, but I have no water or I have no food, then I would die, right? Mm -hmm. Sufficiency is what are all the necessary conditions that you have to give rise to that thing? Now to say, what is all the necessary conditions for a human being, I I couldn't even begin to tell you, right? It's, you know, could be all sorts of stuff, water, air, uh, some people say the so social life, you know, sexuality, all these, you know, so it depends on what your preference is for defining a human. So one easy way to think of it is, how do we define a square, right? A square is, you know, four straight lines connected by 90 degree angles, Let's just assume that's all that's needed, right? And then now you have a square. So you have the necessary and the sufficient, right? Okay, when we think about what intelligence is and what it takes to act in the world, what is necessary and what is sufficient? Well, it's easy to say for humans, it's a brain. For most mammals, it's a brain, right? It's yeah. necessary that you have a brain. Uh, some people might even say it's sufficient that you have a brain because yeah, your brain uh, controls your hands as you uh, sharpen a stick to go hunting with, right? Now, yeah. if I were to take your brain and put it in a vat, in like the matrix kind of yeah. vat, right? And put all these plugs in. I could imagine that I'm still doing that with my imaginary matrix body. I'm still, I'm sharpening a stick. Right? Yeah. I still know how to do it. I still have intelligence, even though there's nothing happening, you know, in the world. Yeah. So that would seem to say that, the brain is necessary and sufficient. Well, let's block off those thought experiments, right? First of all, I don't think that that thought experiment works, the brain and the bat, which we could talk about more if that interests you later. But let's look at the rest of the natural world, right? And let's look at all the intelligent things that happen in the world and that happen in creatures that have very small brains compared to us, very different structured brains, or don't have any brains at all, right? And here are just a few examples. So crows, birds, yes. have very, quote unquote, small brains. Again, I'm putting up the scare quotes with my fingers, right? They have yes. very small brains, right? Yet they do very sophisticated and intelligent things. They use tools, right? So there's video of crows, you know, making yeah. a little spears, to hunt grubs and other kinds of creatures, right? They'll, they'll look for the right thighs and they'll break it and they'll sharpen it, right. you know, and then they'll spear the bug, right? And they'll eat it. That takes all the different things that we think of are intelligent, right? Planning, right. perspective, thought, you know, control, practice, right? Knowing that it worked before or that it could work. Like, like yeah. these are all things we would call intelligent. In fact, uh, until a few years back uh, or a few decades back, we thought that that's the primary defining human capability. We never attributed it to any uh, other species than humans. Tool use, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and we're seeing it everywhere now. Yeah. Right, so we, you know, we see all sorts of different, so, that, so that's the example with a, with a crow. There's examples with things that have uh, 
decentralized brains. So crow, at least it might have a smaller brain, but it's centralized like right. a human. Yeah. Right. And I'm saying that like, like kind of sassy, like a human, because, you know, that's our, our litmus test for everything, right? right? Yes. As long as it's like a human. Yeah. Okay. Now let's look at an octopus, which is pretty much like an alien compared to us. Agree it. The most right. alien-like species, probably. Yeah, it's so strange, right? It doesn't have a centralized brain like we do. Yeah. It has lumps of neural tissue that are located in its limbs. Yeah. But when it does things like uh, movement, it's not like a central controller is telling the limbs to move in a coordinated way. It's more like a bunch of people coordinating their movement together, right? Like right. it's like you know, six people carrying a coffin, right? There's not yeah. one person sitting on top of the coffin. Sorry, that's very morbid, sorry. But that's the first thing I thought of. <laughs> no, that, that's a good segue. We'll talk about morbidity uh, or, or, the, or the very, you know, uh, uh, what should I call? Um, we'll, we'll go into the existential uh, okay. kind of questions in a bit, yeah. That sounds good. Yes. So it's not like there's someone sitting on top of the, the, the you know, uh, coffin saying, okay, you on the left move, you on the right move, you on the left move. They just do it. They, they seem to spontaneously coordinate their movement, right? right? And that's what an octopus seems to do. We can go even, quote unquote, lower, right, on the phylogenetic tree. And we can look at slime molds and things like that that uh, have been recorded in experimental settings as showing some sort of memory, right, and solving puzzles and, and navigating mazes and things like that. So, so is the brain, the human brain, necessary for intelligence? If we want to be honest with ourselves and have a um, widespread definition of what intelligence is, yeah. then no, the brain is not necessary for intelligence. When we look at all these different examples, and more specifically, the human brain is not, yes. intel not necessary, right? So let's you you naturally actually uh, you are there uh, you have landed our conversation to the point where I should ask this question which I had in the list of questions planned for you what exactly is the brain for in that case if it's not required for intelligence and uh, we attribute the human existence to, to how intelligent we are and we rate each other you know to to an extent that you know our survival in in a human society depends on how whatever the intelligence means at that particular point in civilization. So what exactly are brains for then? Oh, that's a really good question. Oh, man. Um, well, for humans, yeah, they're definitely quite important, right? And they're important in that there's something really interesting about nervous tissue and there's something interesting about the electrical impulses that can be carried and, and the different kind of neurochemical activity that happens in nervous tissue. Yeah. Humans happen to have a collection, a big lump of that, very densely collected in our skull. Yes. Right. So, so if we look at development, right, there's a certain point early on when the zygote starts dividing in which we're actually a flat plate with an equally distributed neural crest. But for some reason, over time, it ends up, the neural tissue ends up becoming collected in the front and distributed thinly throughout yeah. the back. And that ends up becoming our spine and becoming even less densely packed into our limbs. Yeah. And so it almost seems like it's um, a historical accident that, we're sh that we just have this brain of densely packed connective tissue that allows for quite fast... Uh, impulses, waves of different kinds, you know, of, of electricity, of neurohormones, of chemicals and things like that. Right. And so I don't think there's anything um, a priori, right, to use more philosophical terms, there's nothing uh, definitionally true that a brain has to be in that shape, that densely packed in our skull, but it is. Yeah. And so if we want to understand control and movement, for example, or memory or things like that, well, it just so happens that in us, a lot of that is densely packed in between our ears. Yes. The, the problem is when you say that 
you could just cut that off and understand those phenomena. That you could understand movement, that you could understand coordination by just looking at that densely packed collection of tissue and not what it's connected to. That's where the fallacy happens. Yeah. So to go back to your original question, what is the brain for? Well, in humans, the brain is for a certain uh, speed of activity that's connected to um, other limbs, other types of organs uh, in a circular kind of relationship, right? So although the brain fires fast, limbs fire a little bit slower, but brain activity is constrained by the limb activity and vice versa, right? So there's a coordination that's happening. Yeah. And if you damage some of that in the brain, well, then you're going to be damaging certain capabilities, at least until it's recovered in different ways. So brain plasticity also shows that our particular organization is not uh, necessitated okay. uh, also. So, yeah, there's a lot packed in there. Happy to explore any of that. Um, so so before, before we, we unpack, uh, you know, that densely packed uh, conversation we had in the last few minutes, uh, going back, uh, you know, you're my first guest and you're a neurophilosopher. And I never asked this question before. And I think this is a pertinent time, given that you have explained so much of philosophy. Uh, what is the role of neurophilosophy in general in, in the whole enterprise of understanding uh, brain behavior, cognition, you call it neuroscience, call it behavioral neuroscience, so you'll not go into the distinction. But what's the role of neurophilosophy in this whole enterprise? Yeah, so I think um, there, there, there's two roads that we can take. One is, um, you know, as a neurophilosopher, you can know more about neuroscience than your average philosopher or your philosopher of mind. And you can import knowledge into philosophical questions uh, informed in a way that other people are not, right? The other direction is to import into neuroscience um, uh, a taste for conceptual clarification, a taste for consistency, a taste for logic, a taste for reason that allows you to question things in a way that your average neuroscientist um, doesn't care about or doesn't have to care about, right? There's a division of intellectual labor and that's okay, right? Your average neuroscientist doesn't have to be questioning the fundamentals of their field. But a neurophilosopher can push them to get clearer on what they mean when they use certain concepts. And so that's, that's one way to think about it is, you know, the, the philosopher, the neurophilosopher is a representative of neuroscience to philosophy. It can yeah. also be a representative of philosophy to neuroscience. Yeah. There's a, a, a third way, which is the neurophilosopher qua researcher. And this is someone who pulls techniques from neuroscience and questions from philosophy and tries to do the research on their yes. own. So I think we see a lot of this with um, issues in morality and issues in free will. So there's a lot of neurophilosophers um, like Walter Stinnett Armstrong, uh, Felipe de Brigard. They both so happen to be at Duke. Uh, but they do a lot of research on free will, on moral decision making. Um, De Brigard, in particular, has formal training in neuroscience, so he he runs his own experiments in you know fMRI and things like that. Uh, but there are other philosophers who have formal training in neuroscience and are bringing those tools to bear. So to summarize, what is a neurophilosopher doing? Well, one, they can be an ambassador. Yeah. Right, and kind of bring these tools to both sides, and they can be a particular kind of researcher. It's much harder to do that uh, because and, it's and, hard to, yeah. And I think you are you are one of those kinds, right? I think you are one of those few who are doing both, who will have one leg in philosophy and also uh, into empirical investigations. Yeah, I, I I try, I try. I think I'm making nobody happy. I think philosophers probably think I'm not philosophical enough and yeah. the empirical people think I'm too philosophical. So that's okay. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, good things you said, like a taste for uh, conceptual clarity, logic, reason, and consistency. 
uh, I think those are some of the most important ingredients for good science and science that actually helps us translate is reproducible and actually land us on, on truth. Uh, so, you know, uh, that's a great service, Luis, to our field. Uh, and I can and go on a 10 hour podcast ranting about, uh, you know, my dis dissatisfaction where I see a lack of, uh, you know, conceptual clarity, logic, reason and consistency in the field. Uh, but we'll give it for some other uh, time and rather focus on more constructive uh, uh, aspects of our field here. Uh, Lui, you told about philosophy and definitely there's a role for neurophilosophy. Uh, for whatever I know about uh, neurophilosophy, what I've read, I see one major field in which I don't see as much a divide or a battle uh, as I see in any other aspect. And that is... Uh, the idea that brain is representational uh, and brain is ecological. And why I'm asking you this question is also because for viewers uh, 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 and to shamelessly self-promote myself and some of Louis's work as, as well, uh, I have two books uh, uh, in contract, uh, which would be coming this year, one on affordances and one on alternative to the computation metaphor. And Louis was gracefully, uh, Louis has gracefully agreed and actually has already submitted two chapters for both books. Uh, and uh, I will talk about, uh, I'll ask Louis to talk about those soon. But before that, Louis, what is, uh, would you like to tell, you know, what are these two things, uh, you know, the so-called representational ideas about the brain and the ecological ideas? Where do you stand on this divide? Uh, are these two reconcilable and uh, things of that sort? Yeah, so first, uh, I'm always happy to hear you rant. Um, so, you know, maybe one day we could do a part two and then we'll just of course. have you rant. Um, so that, that's always fun. Um, but uh, yeah, so what do we mean by, uh, you know, representationalism in neuroscience? Well, representationalism is a general idea that, um, Neurons instantiate, neurons realize uh, everything from uh, images of the world. So if I see a cup in front of me, I'm not actually seeing the real cup, but I've transformed stimulus that hit my retina into a mental image. And somehow my neurons are representing, you know, they're providing a representation of the cup of the world. I can represent uh, reasoning, so my neurons will fire in a certain way in which I'm doing, you know, modus ponens or modus tollens. You know, if this, then this. You know, this kind of reasoning, right? It's all being represented in the brain uh, semantically. It has meaning, right? Language, the words have meaning. They're represented in my mind. Coffee cup is a concept, right? Yeah. And that's represented in my mind. This is pretty much the dominant paradigm in thinking about thinking. So in neuroscience, in cognitive science, in many areas of psychology, in artificial intelligence. Um, I'd like to also say that when I say representational theory of mind, also tied in with that is the computational theory of mind. For our current purposes, I'm just going to use them interchangeably, right? So. The computational theory of mind is thought to perform certain operations. Uh, those operations are operating on representations. Uh, Louis, uh, also... uh, uh, mm -hmm. To interrupt you, are these the same kind of operations which, for example, the CPU in my uh, laptop is uh, is using right now, or is it something else, something different? Well, it depends who you depend. I mean, good question. It depends who you talk to, right? Some people will say, no, 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 they are rat you, what your laptop does and what my brain does is radically different. Okay. But we just say that they both compute. I right? see. And that there's some regularity. Other people would say, well, not exactly. Right? There's a there's a good metaphor there, right, between the operations of a computer and a brain and vice versa. Yeah. Then there's my favorite people to argue with which are the ones that say, it is literally true. 
that what your brain does and how it operates is just like a computer. And it is literally true that what your computer does is just like a brain, right? It's this um, uh, trifecta, right? Between uh, the, the silicon base, you know, MacBook Pro, the blood and neurons based human brain, and then this abstract logical computational principles and they all see. there's they all relate in literal ways sometimes as, as philosophers have said in the past we can think of the brain as the hardware and thinking as the software so in the way that you have you know a pc computer that has particular hardware its motherboard its ram chips right it has its software which is its you know, Microsoft Office or Windows, right? And those are abstract. So again, there's you know, the three ways that I'm simplifying it. The, the literal people, the metaphor people, yeah. and then the loose loose talk people. Right? Loose talk people. I like that. Loose talk people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so again, you know, again, when I when I say representational theory of mind, I'm using it interchangeably with computational. Yeah, because computations act on representations, and then a lot of people say that representations are acted on computationally. So, just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just talking about representational theory of mind here. So that's what it generally is understood to be. Now, yeah. how does that relate to the ecological approach? Is that is, was that the second part of your question? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I don't know that I can answer that without saying what the ecological approach is. Yeah, go ahead, of course. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. So, so ecological approach, I think it is short for ecological psychology. And ecological psychology, uh, and this is my way of understanding it. So maybe Madura has a different way or re, you know, listeners might have another way, but my understanding of it is it's an approach to doing perceptual psychology started in the mid 20th century by James Gibson. Um, and this was a way to push back against um, both behaviorism, right? Kind of stimulus response kind of approaches to psychology and to cognitivism. Cognitivism being the idea that the brain is doing computations, it's an information processing system. So yeah. to do perceptual psychology is to understand how the perceptual system is a computational system. Well, Gibson uh, and late, and at the same time, his wife, Eleanor, um, whereas Gibson, uh, James, the mister, Mr. Gibson was into perceptual psychology. Mrs. Gibson was into developmental psychology. So they were both doing ecological psychology in different ways. But both of them thought, Behaviorism is wrong because there is really interesting internal things happening in the organism and the environment is really important. Cognitivists are wrong because the brain and the inside of your mind is not a computer in any sort of informative way. So we can't explain human development. We can't explain perception in either of those ways, so what's left? So that's where ecological psychology comes in and it says what's left is organism environment systems as the target of investigation. To understand perception is to understand perceptual systems. And perceptual systems are bodies in world. And bodies are constituted by various things. They have uh, tendons, they have certain kinds of eyes, but the environment also is constituted by certain things. There's certain um, structure of light in the atmosphere, air pressure, right? Though all these things come together in real time to be what perception is. And what perception is, is affordances. Affordances are opportunities to act for an organism. Yeah. So I, I always like the example of the cup of coffee, right? Right. So, um, well, your cup is angry, though. Cup. My cup, it, it's starting to run low. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, you I'm have it. Okay. I'm, just a little bit. It's running yes. low, but uh, so when I reach for the cup of coffee, yeah, 
it's not like light is bouncing off the ceiling, right? You know, off of here into my retina. And then it like goes down my optic nerve into these different visual processing. And I'm seeing yeah. angles, right? And then depth and this and that. And then I put that all together. And now I have a representation of a cup. Yes. And then that tells my arm move, but don't yeah. torque too much. Don't go too fast, calculating all this. And then by some act of the gods, I'm able to do all those calculations like that, right. right? Right. That's really hard to believe physiologically, right? Well, that's the most prevalent belief, I would argue. I, I don't think you need to argue. I think it's just a fact. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So what did Gibson and the ecological psychologist say? Well, I'm not perceiving a meaningless manifold of yeah. energy just hitting me. What I'm perceiving is something that is a result of evolutionary time constraining what I see in particular environments that based on my proprioception and my sense of my body yeah. and the information in the world, this thing affords my hand grasping it. Right. And so there's this mutual real time dynamic of my sense of my body and my detection of the world in which I can grasp this cup as being meaningful for me to do something with. Could right. be to drink with, could be to throw up a wall when I get, you know, terrible reviews on a paper, right? But that's how I perceive the world. The world is already meaningful. Yeah. We don't need to add meaning with these computations. Right. Right. So now here's where I'm getting at. I can answer, I can stop right now or I can keep going and say how this differs from representation. No, of course, of course. Please keep going. Oh. All right, cool. Important, so yeah. I, I, I've, I've already sprinkled in some of the ways in which this approach is different from representationalism. One main difference is how representationalists and how ecological psychologists use the word information. So for the representationalist, information is essentially the kind of information that you think of as like ones and zeros as bits of information yeah. in your computer, right? Or maybe a little bit more sophisticated might be uh, uncertainty reduction, so Shannon Weaver information, right. right? But that can be cached out in terms of bits also. Yes. It's all what's being calculated in the brain. Right. And neurons, if they fire, they're a one. If they don't, they're a zero. Right. So you see, it's, it's the same thing, right? I'm saying that, I'm being sarcastic, right. just in case no one can see my face. Um, and so, you know, what you have is meaningless stimulation in the world, hitting my retina, and now my retina is sending, firing these like ones and zeros. Yeah. Other parts of my brain are ones and zeros. That combination is now creating an image in the way that you would create, uh, you know, an image on a computer where it's made of pixels, right? Where it's yes. like, the, you know, the colors are turned on or off. And so this is essentially what's supposed to be happening. Now I have this image created by bits yeah. of the cup in my mind. Ecological psychologists are like, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what we mean by information. What we mean by information is the relevant structure of energy in the environment yeah. that specifies affordances. What does that mean? That's all just yeah. gobbledygook to most people. Energy is not to be taken as anything magical. There is literally energy in the room, energy coming from my lamp, energy yeah. in the wind when I move, right? It affects my hearing. Yes. Right? Pressure out in the air on my arm. This is energy. Okay. Right. And the it has a structure, right? When the light hits a smooth surface, I'm going to lift up. I have this uh, little yeah. wrist thing, right? When the light hits a smooth surface, it's going to bounce off in a very regular, you know, geometric right. way. Yes. Compared to an irregular surface. Yes. Right. And so if I have like my keyboard, which is, you know, all jagged, the yeah. light is going to go in all sorts of different directions. Right. That relationship between surfaces and energy is how I know 
that something affords what it affords. The affordance of graspable is in part due to my having a sense of my proprioception to the structure of the light reflecting off the cup. So information is not equal to affordance, but information allows us to perceive affordance. In that way, and this is where this is where we're coming with the big payoff, I am directly perceiving the cup. Because I am directly perceiving the energies in the world. And I don't need to represent them in my mind. The world is meaningful already. It's not meaningless as the representationalists would have it. So that, that is one of the big divides between so, them. So if I can summarize one of the fundamental differences between the representational and ecological approach is that the representational approach would argue that the brain, the purpose of the brain is to provide meaning to the world. And the ecological approach would argue that the purpose of the brain or the purpose of the whole uh, organism is to find meaning, which already exists in its relationship with the world, right? So I, I would 100% agree with the first part that the representation of the brain gives meaning. Yeah. The second part I would mostly agree with but I would add to it a little bit of nuance. So it's not that the organism is finding meaning in the world because the structure of the energy in the world is in some ways a product of me. When I'm moving, yes. I'm also leveraging some features of that light. So you're creating meaning as well. I'm creating meaning as well, yep. yep. So Louis, that, uh, that makes complete sense. Uh, but is this is, is this difference just descriptive or does it have any implications in terms of how we go ahead and study neuroscience uh, or, or study? I mean, I'm not going into the, uh, you know, every time I utter this word neuroscience, this conversation is making me question, why is it neuroscience? Like why neurons? You know, uh, you see uh, uh, the, the crisis here, right? The crisis uh, is is rooted in the name itself of the enterprise. Uh, when neurons are given uh, so much privilege over uh, you know, all the other aspects of the body and environment. So what would your, uh, uh, what would your response to be, would be to a representational? So I had this uh, conversation with a representational chauvinist, uh, I can say uh, <laughs> a couple of uh, months back. And uh, the person asked me, uh, Madhur, why don't you close your eyes? And I said, yes. Then imagine that you are in your living room. I said, yes. Do you have a wall hanging in your living room? I said, yes. He says, can you tell me what it is on that? And I provided him description. And he says, mother, see, you have representations of that in your brain. So I said, uh, of course, uh, having representation is a very different idea than brain being representational or representation uh, as a way in which brain works. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? Because it's hard for me even to buy this idea that we do not, we cannot represent our environment. Yes, we can represent, right? So what is the distinction between the representational approach and the ecological approach when it comes to uh, terms to the, this having a representation? Yeah. Oh man, you're just, you're asking like all the good questions. They're all huge questions. Like we could do like an episode, just like on all oh, these we will. We, we will plan, you know, detailed, but uh, <laughs> probably a platter of, uh, of ideas here. Yeah. This first one. So, so one thing they first said that, that tickled me, made me laugh is why even do neuroscience, right? Yeah. Um, well, one kind of not interesting reason is that neurons are real. They exist on a certain, you know, spatial scale, and human scientists. I think you know specialization has helped us make a lot of breakthroughs. Right, people who only study chemistry have taught us a lot. People yes. who only study biological or only study ecologies. Right, in that way, I don't. I don't. I'm not trying to take funding away from neuroscientists. They should study neurons, and they're hard to do. I don't want to do that right, with all my time, 
Um, so they should do that. And we're going to learn a lot. And it's going to teach a lot of things about neuroanatomy. It's going to teach a lot of things about um, neuropathologies, right? There's just incredible things to learn. And, and that's why we need a neuroscience. If we want to understand intelligence, right? And we take the perspective that intelligence is not something that just happens in brains, but brains are important, then we're gonna need an interdisciplinary approach, right? You're not gonna be able to cash out intelligence just at the neural scale. You're not gonna be able to cash it out just at the logical, right? Or just at the bodily scale, but you're gonna need teams of people to each know how to talk to each other to make progress on these multi-system level phenomena. And intelligence, I think, is one of the best examples of something that happens at multi-levels, multi-scale, right? Not, you can't just cash it out at one scale, right? The reductionist approach to something like intelligence is just not gonna work, right? The ontological reductionist, I'll be specific, who says that intelligence just is, that's why scare quotes again, just is neurons firing, right? You're gonna need other things like people who understand neuromolecular activity, neural networks, neural systems, but also cardiovascular system, yeah. right? Muscles, all these kinds of things, they're all going to have to come together to understand and talk to each other in a way that they understand each other in order to make progress on these points. And so I, I might be going back a little bit, so, so forgive me. Um, no, it's fine. But it's completely fine. One reason why we need philosophy, giving myself a plug for philosophy, yeah. is we can criticize, we can evaluate what is happening across a field in a way that the practitioners usually don't have to and show where things could be improved. Here's an example. Um, a, a word, maybe we've been talking about it, representation. I've been doing some work with a collaborator, Edward Mashery at the University of Pittsburgh, and we were interested in empirically evaluating how people in the mind sciences, broadly construed, apply the term representation and other similar kinds of terms. So maybe causation or information or aboutness. And yeah. so we did a study where we asked um, groups of neuroscientists and psychologists and philosophers of mind, we showed them some scenarios where we say, okay, this person is shown a face. Um, there is activity in this part of the brain that's being recorded. How would you describe that? And we had different kinds of, of options, right? Different kinds of scenarios, different kinds of options. And we were trying to elicit from them we didn't want them to reflect and think. Right. We just wanted to know how would they apply it. And what we found was that across, we ended up collapsing into groups for the sake of statistical you know, power, yeah. neuroscientists, psychologists, philosophers. And what we found was across the board, much hesitancy to ever say that a neuron represents a fence, for example, that a neural network represents a fence, that a neural region represents a fence. Also, a lot of hesitancy to say things like that neuron is about that fence. But a lot of comfort in saying uh, the face caused the neuron to act, to have activity the face caused the network to have activity, that there is an informational relationship between the stimulus and the activity. It's fascinating to us because at the start of the survey, we asked them a very straightforward question. Are representations required for brain activity or to yeah. explain brain activity? And we had like 98% of neuroscientists and psychologists, and then like 96% of philosophers, they all said yes. So the bar graphs are just yes. hugely different. 
right? But yet, in practice, right. hesitant to ever say anything represents anything. So this is a form of cognitive dissonance uh, within the field, you would argue, right? Yeah. yeah. And so right here's where a philosopher like me and a philosopher like Edward, yeah. we can say, look at this. What are you guys doing? Yeah. Right? Why even say representation? And, and you know, and we provide it. It's, it's far from a literature review, but we just gave some key examples in our paper. And we're like, look at all the different ways that within single papers, they describe seemingly disparate phenomena as representational. And then try and compare that to another paper. How do we know that, um, you know, the representational similarity space analysis yeah. is telling us the same thing at this scale or at this scale or in cognitive neuroscience as opposed to, you know, behavioral neuroscience or, or something, right? How do we even talk to each other? And now tying back to what I said about studying intelligence in an interdisciplinary way, how is a molecular neuroscientist going to talk to a systems neuroscientist, talk to a cognitive psychologist, talk to a philosopher, talk to an educational researcher or you know anthropologist or whatever, when there's no agreement even within fields about yep. what these terms mean? So that's where the rubber meets the road, so to say, right? About why conceptual clarification is important. Quite a mess. It's quite, I think it's quite a myth. Yeah. So when, it, when someone asks me, um, oh, so you, you're not a representationalist about the mind. My, my first reaction is, well, what do you mean first? Right. Give me a definition, right? And so going back to your example about uh, the representationalist who asked you yeah. to close your eyes, right? And then they said, well, see, there's representations are involved. Well, can you like ask them, what do you mean by representation? Right. Right. And then I can say if I agree or disagree with you or not. So Louis, on that note, there's another terminology which has been uh, chefing me a uh, little, which has been mechanism. So for instance, I have been recommended by almost every of my mentor that, you know, to succeed with NIH in terms of grant proposals, you need to be mechanistic uh, in terms of your approach. I mean, and we can define mechanism at multiple levels. Uh, we might differ with that. So when you're talking about a cognitive mechanism, which is a very common term, right? Or a neural mechanism, uh, what exactly are we referring to? Uh, it, so when, I talk, when I'm talking about a machine, like a like some kind of mechanism in my toaster, where the bread is... Uh, sorry about that. That's Alexa. Uh, <laughs> I'm muted my Alexa. So, Louis, so uh, again, uh, regarding mechanism, what exactly is a mechanism? So when I'm talking about my toaster and the idea that uh, when, the, when the bread is toasted, it automatically comes out of it, right? There's some kind of uh, mechanical latch, which when the bread is heated enough or toasted enough, uh, the bread bounces out. Uh, I, I, I have no problem assuming that that's a mechanism. But when it comes to the brain, when we talk about neural mechanism or cognitive mechanism, suddenly there's a confusion which sets in. So what do you mean by mechanism and where is uh, uh, what you can call the lack of conceptual clarity and consistency with this idea in our field? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have no idea what a mechanism is. Uh, and I have no idea what it's supposed to mean. So. If we look historically, and we go back to Newton and Descartes, they are thought of as importing the mechanistic philosophy into science and philosophy. And for them, my understanding is it was essentially um, an emphasis on physicalism uh, and physical law to understand yeah. nature. Now jump ahead to the 1990s, and there was some work by people like uh, uh, William Bechtel, Robert Richardson, Stuart Glennon. These are philosophers, interdisciplinary philosophers interested in particularly biological sciences, especially the former. And they started what is referred to as the, they were starting the new mechanistic movement. And they were saying, oh, when you look at scientific practice, you find that they use the term mechanism a lot. And when they say mechanism, what they mean is 
they approach understanding a phenomenon in a particular style, in a particular way, where they decompose the phenomenon and try to localize functions, right? So how does the heart work? Well, take it apart and understand, right? So then when you take it apart, you realize the valve opens and closes, right? So that's supposed to stop flow and allow flow. The, you know, uh, you know, aorta allows this, the you know, pumping does this or whatever, right? And then you put it back together and now you understand the heart as a mechanism. Then in 2000s paper by Mackimer, Darden and Craver comes out and says, yeah, mechanisms everywhere in science especially the life sciences. And it involves things like regularity. Uh, they use terms like startup and termination conditions. So you define the mechanism by isolating when it starts and when it stops. So they would say things like the Krebs cycle or other things like that have seemed to have clear start and finish conditions. Then for the next 20-ish years, mechanisms was hot on the streets. Right, philosophers were all about it. They said, see, look at scientific practice. They always talk about mechanisms, neuroscientists, biologists, um, all the grants that are being funded yeah. are all looking at mechanisms, right? Um, so we got to explain everything in terms of mechanisms. Then you have people coming in who are like saying, mm -hmm, I think there's some problems with your definition of what a mechanism is. So they show the problem. Another set of papers will come out and say, either we acknowledge that that was a problem, we are now gonna revise what a mechanism is. Or the papers would say, uh, nobody actually believes that. Yeah, we wrote about that, but nobody actually believes that. Well, people have confessed this to me. Yeah, yeah. And so what you end up having happening is that now uh, any definition of mechanism is so broadly applicable it almost refers to anything with any sort of regularity. Right. In that sense, I guess I'm a mechanist, but what work is it doing? Right. In that sense, a neural mechanism is anything that happens with regularity. Okay, so I think with regularity, I have memories in a regular form. I, I, I can reach, I can control my arm with regularity. Is that the mechanism? Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, and if that's what I have to write in my grant proposal, then fine, so be it. But I don't know that it's telling me anything worthwhile. So are we living in some kind of an Orwellian matrix where all of us don't believe in these terms, but we all think that others believe in these terms? So we have to somehow tailor our arguments and interpretations and you know uh, model our proposals around this idea of mechanism. Is that the case or this might be the case? Um, it might be the case. Yeah. It might also be, um, an instance of, I don't know if you know the saying that science progresses one funeral at a time. Whose funeral? No comment. Um, <laughs> but you know, there are a lot of, you know, people who are prestigious and hold yeah. certain positions of influence who think things have to be done a certain way. And I would say that even their students and their postdocs, yeah, uh, are realizing the flaws in the approach, and so it'll sometimes it takes, you know, scientific generations, right? Um, you know, and, until things things are changed. Because actually, what I'm seeing now um, is uh, more philosophers, at least, are resistant to using the term mechanism. And uh, someone was telling me that in a recent philosophy of science association meeting, the PSA, which is you know the biggest philosophy of science meeting. Um, in the world, that they're, they're, they were saying, it seems like now, instead of everyone being pro-mechanism, everyone's being anti-mechanism or, you know, yeah. whatever. So it might just be, you know, be a trend, but that just, to me, makes for bad science, right? Because yeah. then this word, how do we even interpret it now? You know, if somebody used the term mechanism in a 1950 paper, how do I understand it now? Am I allowed to cite it as evidence yeah. for my current quote unquote mechanism? Right. Same thing with representation. Right. Right. By the way, Louis, I mean, I would like to clarify this. Uh, I mean, you, of course, uh, know this, but for the viewers, that despite all the rant we might have against the science and scientific system, 
uh, there's no uh, no enterprise which is so uh, honest. You know, we might have flaws in our uh, ideas about mechanism and things like that, but the uh, but the intent uh, is uh, is is very honest and it's actually very pure. Uh, you know, uh, in in neuroscience as an enterprise or philosophy or or anything we are talking about. Uh, so we do not have any personal grudges against uh, you know any of that. It's just that we are trying to be a little constructive and navigate the conversation and do you know, some of the things uh, which we have realized over time uh, in our careers. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% right to say that and I 100% agree with you. And um, there, in, in my assessment, um, I don't want to say opinion, but in my assessment of you know human knowledge and the history of human knowledge, and nothing has been better than science. Yeah right as a method and it's the best we have yes and um again you know i agree there are there are issues you know and i can go down the list of those issues but it's the best we have and it's giving us the best understanding of the world and um there needs to be more science in more places i think actually uh yeah. informing more aspects of, of daily life and um so yeah I, I i agree to make it explicit none of my criticisms are a criticism uh, to the end of let's bring science down. Yeah. No, it's actually let's make something good even better. Even better, yeah, I agree with you. So, Lewis, you you uh, you have a chapter in my upcoming book uh, on the alternative to the brain computer metaphor, and you talk about energetics. And uh, let me tell you, like this is one of the best. And for the first time, I read those kind of arguments, uh, thinking about brain completely from the energetic standpoint, uh, especially to refute the argument uh, that brain is a computer or operates even remotely like a computer. Uh, uh, in fact, I mean, uh, like I personally see my brain, uh, at least my brain and Lewis's brain more similar to, you know, my coffee here, which has fat scalps and proteins in it. Uh, and as my collaborator Damien calls brain a milkshake, uh, then closer to a microprocessor, like the one I have, for example, in my smartphone. And Louis, you had some really convincing arguments in terms of the energetics. Would you like to elaborate a little bit for our audience here? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you uh, for the kind words um, about the chapter. So um, there's this idea that um, we can understand you know, I, I talked about this earlier, this trifecta relationship, right? There's the silicon based, you know, MacBook Pro, there's my brain, and then there's the abstract principles of, of, re of logic and circuits and stuff like that, right? And zeros and ones. And when there's firing down the transistors in my MacBook of, you know, zero and one impulses, and then uh, the result is a picture of a dog, or there's firing of neurons in my brain where a one is a neuron firing a zero is not and yeah. certain kind of patterns and then now i have a, a mental image of a dog that this is all just equivalent that the substrate doesn't matter because the principles hold so i actually think that's not true so i agree with you that our brains are more akin to a cafe latte than you know to an android or an iphone the substrate matters, right? What it is made of matters. How brains work, we really need to understand not just these abstract principles, these binary switches, but a single neuron is a complex system unto itself. I was just looking at this uh, cool paper, which I can't remember the author's last name. And uh, if you follow up with me, I can send it to you that was treating a single neuron and a dendrite as a two layer neural network. That there's enough computational power, computation, I'm using it as quotes, right? If yeah. we wanna talk in that sort of zeros and ones bits kind of bit. If you wanna think about it that way, then every neuron is its own computing unit. Yeah. That's from within the school of thought of computationalism, cognitivism. That itself is saying your binary switch is actually far more complex. Now, if we look at it from more embodied or complex systems approach, 
it doesn't make sense to treat it as a binary switch because it's all sorts of things happening, right? A, a single neuron is a nonlinear kind of system with a lot going on. Neural hormones, electrical impulses, not to mention glial cells and all sorts of other kinds of cells and, and forces that are acting on the brain. When we think of it that way, we have to realize that what are the driving for understanding what's fueling these systems? We have to understand there's some sort of energy involved. The brain is using a certain amount of energy. Some estimates say 30% of our body energy is just consumed by our brain. A laptop uses a certain amount of energy. If you are a computationalist, a cognitivist, you should say that amount of energy doesn't matter. Now let's look at a specific example. There's this system, the supercomputer that was developed via resources from the Human Brain Project. This is a European multi-billion dollar uh, investment um, in understanding the brain and neurocomputation. And they had this system that they built that filled up a whole floor of a room that took just billions of watts of energy and is comprised of millions and millions of transistors. And it's a supercomputer. It can't really do anything, not even close to what a human brain can do. And a human brain is so much smaller and uses so much less energy. If the principles are the same that are governing the processing of the supercomputer and the governing of my brain, and if energy doesn't matter, I mean, wouldn't it be the case that this uh, neuro, it's actually a neuromorphic computer, it's supposed to be based on quote unquote, uh, mammalian brain structure. With all that energy, I mean, the capacities of that system should be off the chart. Yeah. It should be like a superhuman, like a mega mind, but right. it's not, it's really dumb. It can't do anything. My relatively little brain can do exponentially more. I can walk, I can catch a ball. I can think about what I did yesterday. I can talk to you, right? All these different things with a tiny, tiny little bit, a fraction of the energy usage. Yeah. That leads me to think that there is something radically different between the architecture of a human brain and the architecture of these artificial systems. The energy is like an arrow pointing it. We need to think about something really different in order to understand the architecture of the human brain. I mean, Louis, that's fine, but let's say the recent developments in, for example, large language models, right? And what we are figuring out, uh, very advanced uh, AI systems like ChatGTP with only 32,000 token, tokens can generate uh, quite a bit of complexity in language, you know, perhaps better than uh, uh, some would argue, even you would agree, uh, a lot of undergraduate students it can write better essays than them with just 32,000 tokens, which is nothing but a giant correlation machines. And now they have we have arguments uh, across the board that uh, probably brain is just a big uh, probabilistic uh, correlation machine. Uh, uh, so it might not be about uh, yes, energetics is something, but uh, in terms of structure, it might not be very different. Maybe we will be able to build uh, more soft matter uh, computers, uh, which will consume less energy, but ultimately brain is nothing more than uh, uh, a tokenization machine. Uh, so what would be your rebuttal uh, against that kind of an argument? Yeah, so if we control for the energy issue, you know, we look at the architecture and the output. Uh, I would say, um, let's really compare the output and let's also compare the input. So the output is, you know, it's pretty good. You know, it's better than we've ever seen before. Yeah. But it's not that great. Um, you know, I, I've used it a few times to see, you know, what it would produce and the kind of answers it would give. And it might be very low level undergrad, I might even say mid level high school student level output. So it's not working at the level at which, you know, 
you or I, you know, as professionals in our fields, I would not expect it to output at that level. I would also say the input um, is very different, right? The, when I think about, you know, and I'm writing a paper and I'm self-correcting and I'm self-generating uh, based on prior experiences and I'm being creative, that is quite different than what's happening with these large language models. These large language models have a finite set of inputs and those inputs are being checked by human, human observers. So they're actually being corrected before they get set into the system. So I don't have that kind of supervision, right? right. This is like hyper-supervised learning, right? right? It's not even building the supervision into the network. It's actual human beings are correcting it. Right. No human being is correcting my thoughts until like I put it on paper and then someone quote unquote corrects it. You know, they say, oh, that's, that's actually not what happened in history or that's a good idea, but your reasoning is wrong. That's not what I mean, right? I'm right. talking about the production system. Right. right. My production system is unsupervised. It's self-organized. Right. And so uh, these large language models, the outputs are interesting. Right. But the inputs are, and the, and the self work, the inputs are bad, right. <laughs> bad as, as, as being at the level of intelligence of a mammal. Right. Uh, and then the internal self-organization is absent, I would say. And that's not in any way what we are like as, or, and I wouldn't even say it's close to what a crow can yeah. do. Right. So, I'm curious so what you think. Uh, I mean, so I recently attended a, a workshop uh, at Emory uh, and one of the major themes was embodiment. Uh, and we had, we had people arguing that, uh, you know, both for and against whether uh, AI systems like ChatGTP have uh, some sort of embodiment, uh, whether they are creating meaning by themselves or they are actually just reflecting the real world statistics of our own language. Uh, of course, I am on the side that it is just reflecting the statistics of our own language, given that they are fed text already generated by us. Uh, so of course, I don't attribute them to any uh, uh, these AI softwares, any of that human capability, and I don't see them going that way either. Uh, but there's a widespread confusion in our field, right? Uh, I believe uh, based on some sort of insecurity among researchers, you know, where would we would be relevant in the future, uh, you know, contributing to a large part of it. But I'm on your side. Uh, I mean, we are very, uh, we are ecological machines. I mean, sorry to use that metaphor. It's it's so difficult to to avoid it you know, <laughs> as much as you try. You know, the idea of mechanism is also coming out of machines, right? As soon as we get away with the uh, with the machine thing, we have to come up with a new word, uh, you know, parallel to mechanism. So anyways, yeah. So I'm on your side uh, completely, you know, uh, with these thoughts. Uh, a lot of things, these things, I guess, uh, you are talking about in your new upcoming book, The Ecological Brain. So, would you like to introduce us, uh, give us a teaser of what what's in it, what kind of surprises we should be ready for, and how are you are trying to rock the rock the boat? I guess. <laughs> um, the book. Thank you for uh, allowing me to plug uh, my upcoming book. Um, so, yeah, it's called The Ecological Brain. Uh, it's being published with Routledge, um, the Resources for Ecological Psychology series. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Um, and, and, and in the most straightaway sense, it's an attempt to reconcile ecological psychology and neuroscience to give a, a unified framework for understanding the mutual interest, the targets of mutual investigative interest. So, um, if ecological psychology is studying it, what areas of neuroscience are also studying those things? So perceptual neuroscience, systems neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, um, and how are they explaining it? Ecological neuro, ecological psychology uses a lot of tools from dynamical systems theory and things like that. Um, so neuroscience uses a lot of computational methods. So those are the areas of neuroscience that I mean when I say I'm trying to reconcile ecological psychology and neuroscience. I'm not so much interested in like molecular neuroscience, that's kind of, you know, not really relevant uh, what they study to the phenomena that ecological psychologists study. So 
what I offer is a framework grounded in complexity science. And so what I like about complexity science is that it offers concepts, methods, and theories that are scale free. So you can use the same methods, the same words to describe things at the molecular level, at the uh, organism environment level, right? And this gives us a way to give a common language to understand phenomena that the neuroscientist and the ecological psychologist can both appeal to. And the specific theory that I offer uh, is called the neuroecological nexus theory, or NEXT for short. And what this is, is it's a way of connecting uh, major scales of investigative interest. So ontologically speaking, I think there's a continuity, a flow from the neural to the body to the world and back. But that's a lot of data to deal with as an investigator. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's fair to draw lines as best you can for the sake of your investigation, for the sake of comprehensibility. I like to tell you know my students that I like very simple ideas because I'm a mostly hairless chimp. Okay, I am part of a selection of a species that tried to survive, tried to breed, tried to hunt, tried to not die. wasn't really selected for solving. Uh, super complicated problems, right? Yeah. So that, that's how I view myself. And actually the complexity science, although it uses the word complex, it actually is quite simple in the way that it distills very complicated ideas into very simple concepts and methods. Yeah. And so next gives us the way to carve up that flow in three ways. One is the neural scale, which I think is, you know, when we're thinking about perception and action, I think neural populations that mesoscale uh, is the proper uh, scale. And one way to understand that is with neural manifolds, which we talked about earlier, uh, which I can get into, but we probably don't have time. But basically neural populations, connecting that to body synergies. So the organization of the body in terms of task specific organizations. So my body will reconfigure to solve different tasks. My ability to do Brain surgery is a different configuration than my ability to catch a fly ball. Yes. Right? But there are really important connections between neural populations and those synergies. And then the connection between those synergies and environmental or ecological information. Yes. So the synergies are also constrained and informed by the structure of ecological information. Yes. And that ecological information is also altered by the structure of the synergy, which is going to have a feedback yeah. or a kind of you know, interaction with the time scale of the neural activity. None of them I take as fun, more fundamental than the other. There's a continuous feedback loop going on these multiple scales. And so from this framework, I think we have a way to um, do what neuroscientists want, which is give the neural story in perception action activities. It gives what the ecological psychologists should want, which is what the body's contributing, what the environment is contributing. Uh, and in doing so, I think I'm gonna make everyone upset. So my first chapter starts with that statement, making everybody upset. I think that if we're gonna explain a full systems account of things like yeah. perception action, in humans, you're gonna need to tell the neural story. I don't think there's any way around it. Neurons, yeah. nervous system is an important part of how we control muscle, right? Yeah. It's not the most foundational, but it's important. So ecological psychologists are gonna have to acknowledge that their story is limited without right. that. The neuroscientist is gonna have to admit that computations, representations, uh, brain-centric neurochauvinism, these things are not gonna work giving an account of what's happening at the gross behavioral and environmental scale. Yeah. So everyone's going to be upset because everyone's going to have to give something up and everyone's going to have to loosen their grip. Um, I try to motivate my story with some historical reasons why there is a divide between ecological and neuroscience and more broadly between embodiment and neural kind of approaches. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we'll see. We'll see how, how it's received or not. 
Um, oh, that's I'm very worried, exciting. Yeah. I'm worried that one of two things might happen. One, it might happen with what happened to David Hume. So when David Hume published his first major work, he said it fell uh, stillborn from the press, meaning it was already yeah. dead before it even got published because nobody ca nobody cared. Yeah, That's kind of worrying. My other worry is that it's going to get picked up, but everyone's going to say it's the worst thing they ever read. They're going to find that everything's wrong. So we will see a lot of re lot of book reviews published about your book, right? That's my worry. Getting yeah. it apart. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll come for your defense, Luis. Luis when I, thank you. If I get a chance, yes. Yeah, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> if that happens. Uh, no, I, 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 you know, I'm very hopeful that you'll get a very positive response because uh, with my recent interactions, uh, both with neurologists, a neuroscientist, and even uh, some psychologists, there's a general dissatisfaction where the field is going. And a lot of... Uh, the so-called sociological aspects of science, right? The pressure to publish and the pressure to get grants and, you know, a lot of work-related uh, constraints kind of give us less room to delve into these things and loosen our grip. Uh, and I think uh, I think the field is ripe for these kind of, uh, you know, rocking the boat movements. And there's a growing movement in, in, in our field in general to embrace these perspectives and, uh, you know, things change, especially for an, from the new generation coming up all right, as you said, science progresses uh, probably multiple funerals at a time. Uh, <laughs> no names uh, yeah. dropped here. Uh, so, Louis, uh, when do we expect? When are we expecting this book to come out? Um, probably uh, fourth quarter, twenty twenty three. So okay. the end of end of this year. Well, that might coincide with uh, uh, my own edited volume uh, on affordances and. Uh, uh, Louis has a small chapter on Nexus, uh, on the next, sorry, uh, the new Nexus theory in that book as well. Uh, so, Louis, would you be willing to provide us some of the resources which we I can put links to uh, in the final uh, YouTube uh, submission yep. for this uh, discussion between us? As well as Happy would to, you yep. be, as well as would you be willing? Of course, uh, we'll have more conversations. Would you would you be willing to moderate a kind of discussion if I have on my a podcast, uh, a set of representationalists and, uh, you know, the neuro chauvinist versus Gibsonian ecologists, eco ecological psychologist. Would you like to moderate? Because you are one of those few people yeah. who are informed uh, in a very, uh, you know, comprehensive manner from both sides. Yeah, um, that sounds uh, exciting and scary. So yeah, I will say a tentative yes. Uh, okay. Because the, the, the fear is in me, but also the excitement. <laughs> yeah. No, this is where, you know, with this podcast, it's a first episode and, you know, the vision is still fluid. This is where we want, I mean, we want to have the debates, you know, we want, without getting personal about, you know, uh, our own motivations and things like that. You know, we really want to see where things fit and where we can construct each other, provide constructive criticism to each other or where we can, we can find some points of reconciliation. You know, mm -hmm. and see the field moving forward. So, uh, thank you, Louis. This was a wonderful conversation. Uh, you know, I I learned a lot of things, and our viewers probably also uh, got to know a lot of what you are doing, uh, how important your philosophy is in our field. Uh, and uh, I look forward to having you again. Uh, yeah, thank you for the uh, invitation. And thanks, Louis. Uh, have a great day ahead. You too, and uh, I'll keep a lookout for uh, an email if you want to follow up about any site you know, of resources. Uh, uh, of course, in a few minutes. All right, thank you, Madhu. Yeah. Have a good one. Yeah, bye, Luis. Bye-bye.